Welcome to OK Smart Ass. This is the show where we put technology under the microscope. In this episode, I enter the metaverse with touch, smell, sight, sound, but not taste. Although, I've never really been accused of having any taste anyway. Now time to look at what's happening in technology innovation and the gadgets that make our lives so much more exciting. Hi, I'm Patrick Bonello. And I'm Tor Roxburgh. I'm a writer and a reader and someone who loves change and future-focused thinking. Patrick, I'm focused on real-world problems like my laundry and a robot that's going to make life easier for me. I'm a journalist. I have a marketing and graphic design business and I'm pretty well ready to place my order for the world's fastest laundry robot. This is amazing. You you need to have a look on Google and go to speed folding because this robot is absolutely phenomenal. So researchers at uh, UC Berkeley Mm -hmm. in their auto lab there, they've been working on a robot that will be able to sort out your laundry. And I like to see scientists focus focus. (laughs) I like to see for scientists focusing on the things that matter, like domestic work. That, I mean, this is matter. really... Ma- I'm serious. I'm oh, not being I, sarcastic. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Domestic work. Let's be liberated from it. Yeah. I love it because in the past, laundry folding robots were slow. Oh, I didn't know they oh, existed. They were re- oh, well, yeah, they've tried. Okay. And they've been really slow. Now, now when I say slow, this is 30 to 40 randomly dishevelled items in an hour. <laughs> Everything about it is so sweet. Well, and like that's that's what one piece of, uh, one item every one and a half minutes or one, maybe one yeah. minute and 20 seconds. Yeah. Have you ever seen me do laundry? No. Oh, I can tell you it's, I do it a lot slower than that. <laughs> well, yes, uh, but I'm quite particular about how I like things folded. I don't iron at well, all. I was going to say, how can you be particular about folding when you don't even iron? I don't know. I like it in the drawer to be... Well, each thing has its own folding rules, and this is what I'm worried about with the robot. Like, have they got the Roxburgh household? Oh my God, you're folding worried. Rules. Sorry, first world problems. <laughs> you're worried about the folding rules. <laughs> what the hell? Okay, so how do you fold a pair of underwear? Well, it goes into three: one, two, and over. Okay, and how do had, you do fold a pair? Of just underwear? fold them in half. Oh yes, and then it's not yeah. as sort of. Oh Cute. God! Socks. Now this is a, this is yeah. very important. If you've got long socks, do you put them up against each other and then fold the top down, or do you get them from the bottom and roll them up and then fold the top over it so they're nice and neatly Next in a little to bundle? Next each other, top down, but not tucked all the way in if they're long. Just the tops rolled over. Okay, so we're pretty consistent on that then. I yeah, think. Okay. Yeah. Short yeah. socks. Yeah. Okay. I can't what believe we're having shirts? this discussion. Um, Button down the front. No, nah, I hang them up. Oh, yeah, that's nice. I never fold a shirt. I yeah. always hang it up. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And I always, I've, the other thing is, I, so I, we've spoken on the show about the fact that I lost most of my clothes when I was traveling through Europe. Yeah. Yeah. And so I had to go to op shops and things because I was just too tight to go and buy new clothes. <laughs> but um, the thing is, when I do search for clothes, I look for stuff that doesn't need to be ironed. Oh, so yeah. I look for, you know, the fabrics that don't crinkle. Yeah, look, ironing, I think, is a 20th century issue, don't you? 19th. Yeah, yeah. 19th. <laughs> you might as well be just banging stuff on a yeah, rock, let yeah. it draw, hang on a branch. So it's called speed folding, but in fact, the research shows that humans are still faster. Yes, yeah, some but humans. But that's not the point, is it? The no, it's because the thing is, you just, yeah. it doesn't matter how long it takes. You just yeah. leave all the stuff there, walk away, come mm. back sometime after you've gone for a stroll in the park, walking the dog, and it's all folded and ready. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm loving it. I'm or the it. robot's wearing your bras <laughs> and <laughs> knickers. Well, that's fine. I don't have any problem with that. No, no. <laughs> I, I don't actually have any bras or knickers, by the way. Well, there we go. <laughs> You're talking in general terms, <laughs> yes, aren't you? Yes, in general terms. How much yeah. money? It's going to be expensive. It's $58,000 at the moment. Oh, gosh. Yeah, that's a little US. bit much. It is, it is. But, but the thing is, we know that entry-level stuff is going to be expensive to sure. start with and it, it drops in price. But remember, it was only recently that Amazon bought Rumba, the you know, the iRobots, yeah. the vacuum cleaner robot mm. that you desperately want to get. Well, I've been looking, in fact, um, for you and I, thinking we should not invest together but separately. Right. Um, 
There are so many to choose from, and I don't know which one yeah. is the right one. So you might have to review that. Okay. All right. Us. So one point yeah. seven billion dollars Amazon paid on it for the Roomba. Yes. So that says a lot about a company as big as Amazon investing in something like that. So I yeah. look. I, yeah, I think it'd be good. Um, I. Don't know that I'm ready to place my Christmas order quite yet. Yes, okay. But I've got to say I'm pretty excited about it and hoping that it's going to be coming to like fold my washing suit. Yes, I think it'll be good. I'm a bit worried that it might take up quite a bit of space. And for those people who are not watching our new YouTube, mm-hmm. go and have a look. Yeah. Okay, smart ass. Um, it's kind of like a, a wrestler's stance. It's like the robot's a torso and it's got its arms kind of akimbo, ready to leap onto your T-shirts. And <laughs> well, it's, it is. It's it's basically a two-armed robot with yeah. um, articulated fingers, which is yeah. pretty good. I think it's only got three fingers on each hand. Yeah. You but should have a look at the video. It's really cute. Yeah, good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was really excited about talking about clever tech, and yeah. I know folding is important, Yes. but this is kind of folding. It's a needle that folds into different directions. Yeah, is that a segue? That. Well, um, there's, it's called an arc surgical needle. Mm-hmm. And one of the issues, I guess, with having surgery is that just that. You know, open surgery means that there's a lot more in terms of the healing process. And, you, it's, you know, big operation is just that. What doctors are now looking to do, instead of using a scalpel, to try to get into parts of the body that are hard to access. Mm. They want a guidable needle. Mm. So surgical needles are rigid, Mm. but this needle has a hollow point on it and also it has a little sleeve over it and it can be articulated. Mm. So it can move. So they can guide the needle in and then change its direction. Ah. Isn't that great? It is. Yeah. It sort of also feels creepy, but yes. Right. Like a worm inside you. See, now you've made it sound creepy and I was so yeah. excited about it. Now I'm well, feeling a bit creeped thing. out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I did read that there's a, a toss-up about whether it should be made of um, stainless steel or glass. Ooh, okay. Did you see that? Because apparently the stainless – well, obviously, to guide the needle, they're using – Scanning devices. Yep. Oh, so glass wouldn't scan as well as steel, well, would it? Well, that's kind of good in a way because apparently the steel reflect has some noise because it is reflective. Ah, oh, okay. Whereas if they use glass, although it's not as good in terms of a needle, it's better for the scanning purposes. Okay. Now, this is work that's being done at Strasbourg University and it's called an arc needle. Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's basically, a, it's a tube. Yeah. Uh, and the outer tube is kind of rigid, but then it slides up and that can con- yeah. control and, and guide the head. And it's the, got the a, head. A, a beveled end. Yes. And the the way that they get the inner needle, the movable, bendable one, to bend in the right direction is that it bends around that beveled edge. It kind of curls. I see. Then you can control yeah. which way it goes. Yeah. Wow, that's so interesting, isn't mm. it? Yeah. Mm. Okay. So, hope yet. They, they, they haven't done human trials as yet. Mm. And we're talking about the diameter ranging from 0.9 to 4.4 millimetres. And, uh, and yeah, so there's a lot of hope yet. They're, it's it's been commercialised by a French company mm. called Connectus. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're looking at home, hopefully, human trials um, very, very soon. Yeah, sounds good. I'd be trialled on it if I had to get urgent yeah, stuff Yeah, and done, much I better be than being, you know, opened up with the clamps oh pulling the chest apart. Oh, or, oh. Well, they'll probably still have to do that, but... Yeah. For some things. But For no, this, things. well, there's hope there. Yeah. That's great. Um, Google, now this is an interesting one because... This evidently the techs at Google have an yeah. interior kind of running joke yeah. about people using incognito mode. Now, yes. are you familiar with what incognito mode I is? I am, but yep. um, I think not everyone necessarily will be. So, when you open your um, your browser, your browser, and in Chrome or what, whichever one you're using, or is it only Chrome that it only works Chrome. in? Yeah, well, there are incognito modes in other computers. Yeah. But they call them something slightly different. So yeah. you, you're in your browser and you don't want your browser to track what you're doing. Yeah, and cookies don't get recorded yeah. as well. And you can choose it, and it opens up this kind of spy icon. <laughs> it is, isn't it? But they laugh at it. Yeah. It's a running joke. Yeah, because the thing is, there's actually a court case that's underway mm. because what 
the, the, the claimants are saying is that Google has misled people into thinking that when they're in incognito mode, they're totally private and no one yeah. is able to see what they're doing yeah. online. And that is a very real concern. Mm. Now, it could be something as basic as me wanting to buy you the perfect gift for Christmas mm. and I don't want you to know where I've been so you can't see what I'm going to get you for Christmas. Right. Okay. Because you didn't a, think of that as a first thing, did you? No. no. So um, <laughs> you thought about me going to dodgy sites. And in fact, does that work? Is that effective? Like yes. yes. So what it does is it does mark your history on your computer. Yeah. So things that normally happen when you use a normal browser, you can go into history and you can see where the person's been. So mm. you can see what I've clicked on, all the links, and and that is recorded. Also, cookies, uh, bits of information when you go to a site that record analytics related to that visit as well. So that's what the cookies do. Yes, yep. but it doesn't disable the cookies, yes, does it? Does. it? Yes, it does. It does. It does. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. So right. they can be, and site data can be disabled. However, yep. what a lot of people, and in, in Australia, this is an example, our ISPs, our internet service yep. providers that Which we use. Which is like your street address for your... Well, it's not no, no, literally no, you're thinking, no, you're thinking your IP, not ISP. Oh, okay. No, yeah. ISP is your internet server provider. So, right. say Telstra or Optus or right. TPG or one of those yeah. companies that provides internet access. Okay. They are required by law in Australia to keep your data of where you go. Oh, for your two metadata? years. Yes, for two years. Right. Okay. okay. Now, the argument was used by the government. I'm going to take a slight tangent here. Yeah. Was we don't know we don't, we don't want to know what you're doing online. We just want to know where you've gone. My argument with that is if I walk into a massage parlour, yeah. you can you guess know. what I'm doing online yeah. and I'm doing it there yeah. as opposed to walking into a pharmacy or yeah. a supermarket. Yeah. So, look, I, I was never really a big fan of tracking everyone's you know, yeah. IPs and, and saying where they're going. But anyway, that's what happens. So, incognito won't stop that. Mm. Okay, so... When you go to a site, the site knows where you're from and there's a unique IP. That's what you were talking about. Yes. Your unique identifier that says where you are. Now, you can, there are other things that you can employ to try to mask what you're doing. You can use a VPN, mm -hmm. a virtual private network. And, and if you're using a VPN, then, for example, if you want to use Netflix mm -hmm. and watch the array of movies, but Australia doesn't have quite the number of shows that are available yeah, in the you're States. Not suggesting something dodgy there, Patrick. Not at all. You just <laughs> change your geo location yes. to the United States yeah. and then you can get access to shows that are not available in Australia okay. or you might go yeah. to Switzerland or you might go virtually yeah. to another country. But incognito Doesn't is do not doing that for you. No, no, no. Okay. So so it's just, well, anyway, so there's, there's been a case, so it's a bit of a legal skirmish that kind of began in 2021 mm -hmm. when three Chrome users filed a class action, basically a complaint alleging that Google does track and store browser history and other data regardless of the actions that we take to safeguard our privacy mm -hmm. by using something like incognito mode. So Google's basically saying, no, we don't, but this is how this has all come to light. So whether or not they are storing that information is kind of immaterial in this case because what it's trying to do is highlight the fact that incognito mode isn't what people may think it is. Right. And that's the key point, yeah. is when you're in incognito mode, it's not going to track what you're doing on your computer. Mm -hmm. So if I jump onto a site and then you jump onto my computer and look at my browser history, it's not recording that. Right. Okay. But a third party may be able to know. So another website uh -huh. might be able to know, your internet service provider might yeah. know, but it's just about that machine that you're using at that time. Because you laughed at me before the show because I said that when I was buying airline tickets, I had this theory that the 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 retailer jack up the price if they saw me coming back over a period of time thinking about whether to buy it or not. And so I've been using incognito mode to try and kind of <laughs> trick the hotel booking service or the airline booking service, but you said I've misunderstood it. Well, it's tracking your, your IP address you're not hiding, yeah. um, so you need to use a VPN to do that, and that would effectively mask it. Um, and so when you go to a website, it also depends on whether or not you're logging in. So, mm -hmm. for example, if I use Google as my primary way, because you can use your Google passwords to log into websites as yes, well. Yes. Now, this is, I'd actually use incognito a lot mm. when I'm logging into my client's Google accounts because I can use incognito and, and log in under a different client account. So you could you could select or, or set up a totally different profile mm. and log in that way. Mm. Um, but it depends on how you're logging into the site. So you could have multiple logins. But look, the reality of it is, yeah, if you're, if you're looking at stuff online, um, it may hide some cookies, but it, it may not. And mm. you may well find that you're 
you know, mm. your washing machine that you were looking at or your airline tickets yes. are not going to be any cheaper. <laughs> yeah, like everything is not as we think it is, especially with data. You know? oh, and, and smart speakers. Now, I've got friends of mine mm. who would come to visit yep. and I have smart speakers pretty well almost in every room. So I've got a little Google Home speaker. Now, my friends would unplug it what? at night. <laughs> <laughs> because they were worried that Google would be listening to what they were doing. <laughs> That's a real fear. Don't laugh. It's a very real fear. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So no, I have heard this. You know, yeah. I have heard yeah. people. And look, I, I get that. And yeah. I guess I've got them all over my house. I've got them in my office. I've got them in my bedroom, my dining room, mm. lounge room. Yeah I've, got, yeah, I've pretty well got them all over the place. And they're handy because I can turn lights on and off with them. I can do lots of different things with them. I can set timers in the kitchen, which I love using them for. Mm. I um, haven't burnt any pine nuts in years. Right. That's good. <laughs> but But tell us, Patrick... It's not the case that Google is listening. No. You've got to think of it in terms of, and I'm not just talking about Google because, of course, Amazon has the Alexa yeah. speaker and, and uh, people walk around with one in their pocket all the time because it's Alexa or it might be, um, yeah. you know, Siri or it could be, um, mm. I was going to think of, I was going to say Cortana, but <laughs> nobody uses Microsoft <laughs> yeah. anymore and I don't yeah. think anyone uses mm. Cortana. But the reality of it is that we, we have these speakers that we're kind of travelling around with all the time. But the smart speakers that I'm specifically talking about have certain keywords. Yeah. So what happens is you have an activation that might be OK or Hey mm. in front of the name of the speaker. I'm not mm -hmm. going to say it because then no, all those speakers are going to go off. No, because office will come to life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so... Those keywords are being listened for, but nothing else is. Yeah. So once that activates those specific words, now this is an interesting study that was done by Chubb Security, mm. and it was it was interesting that they did the study because it's independent, obviously, mm -hmm. of the company. So if if, it, if the study was done by Google, you'd be a bit yeah, sus, yeah. Or or Amazon. So yeah. the fact that they 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 basically looked at the cyber risk and I guess the gap between awareness. And the actions that that that's but that are being observed. So, yeah. what are people doing? And one of the really big things is that uh, people are, are overwhelmingly worried yeah. about the data that they have being leaked. And and you can imagine now, particularly with the Optus breach in Australia, the Medicare, Medi Medibank, Medibank, and the, rather, yeah. the Defence Force, yeah, 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 internal so, network leak. Yeah. yeah, so there was some research conducted for Chubb by a company called uh, Dynata, and they found that 92% of consumers are concerned about a cyber breach exposing their personal information or mm. identity. That's probably even higher in Australia now. Oh, I would think so. Yeah. And yeah. look, um, I sort of went down, I think, a, a positive rabbit, rabbit hole, not a kind of conspiracy-driven okay. rabbit hole, yep. because uh, this story came from... PC mag and the journalist just as a throwaway line said seriously that keepsake password has to go yeah. and I didn't know what a keepsake password was so I ended up going to the New York Times magazine and reading this fascinating article by Ian Urbina in 2014 all about passwords and the anthropological aspect of passwords wow, and okay. how people choose their passwords and the meaning of them. And one of the really interesting aspects of the article was that in um, uh, the 9-11 Twin Tower disaster, uh, so many people were killed in businesses and all their passwords obviously died with them. Their business-related passwords we're talking about mainly – and one company that was um, time sensitive because it was a, a a company related to things on the stock exchange, right? Really needed to find those passwords, and someone was assigned the task of ringing the bereaved. Oh gosh! I know, yeah. and very, very, very diplomatically and gently asking, "And what's your daughter's birthday? And what's the name of wow. the dog?" and what university and what football team did the person support. And then, you know, 
the whole IT team was kind of crunching all of that to try and find the passwords. Wow, that's yeah. really fascinating. So there must be a systematic approach that you can take to try to disclose that. We see that in movies all the time. Yeah. You know, where someone's logged, you know, snuck into somebody's office and they jump on and they think, okay, what's his yeah. dog's name or his yeah, first child exactly. or whatever. But that's yeah. true. It is yeah. what people do. Well, the paradox is that we're meant to avoid personally significant passwords because they're easy to guess. But as humans, we only really remember things when they're personally significant. Yeah, that's a tough one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, they've, they've found in this, this same journalist um, looked at research that analysed an enormous breach of passwords that took place, you know, in the mid-2010s. And they'd analysed all the passwords because they had access, access to, to it, them. Yeah, of course. Um, and they found that the most common emotion associated with the password was love. Oh. That's how people really? choose them. Yeah. And I've got my, I think I've mentioned before in the podcast, I've got my master password for my um, password service. Cause it's like I, 36 characters, isn't it's it? It's about 36 wow. characters, which is really good because it's, a 12-character password takes 62 trillion times longer to crack than a six-character password. So you can imagine with my 36, I'm doing Never. well. Yep. But each word in there is associated with a, a very positive kind of not so much love a person, love a moment or a new experience. Right. And so I could make a password that said my favourite birthday was when I was six. Yes, but maybe not the number six or birthday, but maybe, you know, was it that it was at the swimming pool? Right. So something that's not going to be easy for someone else to guess, but yep. it's got that emotional tone for you. Um, and and then I had a little bit of a look about how many passwords people have. And this is... Uh, an estimate based by LastPass, which is a password service. So they say in 2009, people averaged about 21 passwords. In 2014, it was 81. In 2017, it was 191, 85 of those being work passwords. That, that's a staggering amount. I think it's so, an overestimate, I think it has but never to, yeah. le nevertheless. I guess I could kind of count up how many passwords, because these days we use passwords... For every website we go to, if we're re-logging yeah. back into that website. Every app. Yeah, every app that we use, mm. it's staggering. I, well, you, you use a password locker, don't you? You've got a yeah a little password safe. And so when I want to access something, I first have to use my master key and then it fills. Autofills. Autofills yep. for me. Mm. And it kind of times out if I'm not actively using it. Yeah. You probably use a better approach than I do. But um, you've got two-factor authentication. I have, and I use a – actually, got a physical key that I plug into the USB drive to get into my Google account. But once I'm in that account mm. on that computer, then it can be accessed if you know the passcode to get into the computer, I mm -hmm. suppose. So mm -hmm. it's only if I log out of it and go to another computer and log in, I need to have that digital key. Yeah, 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 and all of us find it hard. Sixty-one percent of people say they struggle to keep track of their passwords, and thirty-five percent report reusing across multiple sites, which is thirty-five <laughs> percent. That's a lie. You think it's Everyone, like eighty yeah, percent? I'd say ninety-five. <laughs> Come on, everybody does. Yeah, they do, don't they? Yeah, I reckon. Yeah, we could easily do. And a the survey. only way to not do that is to have a password manager like yeah. I do, because it generates the password for you. Yes, we do that for our clients. We generate. Um, lots of passwords for them when we're creating websites for them. The only only time I ever change them is when it has a tilde. Do you know what a tilde is? Um, yes, the little wobbly symbol yeah. that means approximately in maths. Yes, yeah. so that's on a keyboard, but no one knows where to find yeah. it. It's yeah. in the top left-hand side of the keyboard, yeah. but a little tilde symbol. People look at it, it's like, what? It's a <laughs> wobbly dash. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I tend to take that out so that people, right. when they do retype they can, it, they know. They can manage yeah. it. Yeah. The other thing in that New York Times magazine article that was really interesting was there was one person 
who use, you know, at work often if you're an employee, you have to change your password every 30 days. Oh, I know. Yeah. Yeah. He used it to prompt behaviour change in his life and he would have ring mum every Sunday. Oh. And then the next month it might be try not to eat sugar. Oh. <laughs> you know? Oh, I still would struggle to <laughs> and remember those, I reckon. And he had to type that in, so wow. it reminded him to do those things oh, there you in go. his own life. Right. That yeah. makes sense. It's I guess quite You clever. could do positive reaffirming things. Yes, yes. yes. You are a genius. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love that one. Um, oh, I have to tell you, I went to, this is completely unrelated, but I, I went kayaking in New South Wales, and the kayaking instructor said now be very careful when you get in and out of the kayak because that's when people fall over so mid kayaking we stop have a rest we're getting back in and my internal monologue is you are a genius you're doing so well getting into this kayak (laughs) and i and it rolled over over. and i fell right in the water yeah (laughs) So maybe we won't use the genius password yes, this month. Yes, you can yes, come up with another one for next month. That kind of will toss you into the water. <laughs> That's no good. Yeah, I can't tell you how creepy I find this next story mm. because we have spoken uh, over the length of our podcast because yep. we're going into episode 40. Mm-hmm. So we have talked about lots of different things. And um, I think one of the more interesting was using deep fake to yeah. recreate re- our relatives. so Make the move from anima- still Animating photos, photos yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. And then having some semblance of conversation yes. with voices that sound similar to yeah. the person who's passed. Yeah. Well, now they're talking about creating, uh, I guess, a chatbot that is the dead relative. Yeah. Now, this is all because there was a journalist who had lost his father to cancer. Yeah. But before his father passed away, what he did was he recorded a whole lot of snippets of yeah. information on From top. His, da- also his dad was recorded alive. his dad. Yes, recorded his and dad. And this is James Farlo- Farlos. Do you think that might I be I think hard? it's Farlos, yeah. yeah. And so he, he did this with his father, and now he's able to recreate that using an app called Hereafter, mm-hmm. which is even a creepy name. I know. And he talks to his dad on, dad on a daily basis. Yeah. This is a VR representation, a virtual, not a virtual reality, but it's a, an AI version yeah. of his father. Yeah. Now, I have to tell you that this was a short story idea I had that I oh. never wrote. So it oh. just goes to show yeah. Yeah. that ideas are nothing until you express them. Yeah. And I had this idea that um, such a thing would come to exist and that we'd be incredibly in- addicted to it. Because just think about... If you could tweak it so that, and I'm sure you will be able to, so that your parent treats you very nicely. Oh. Imagine, like... You could rewrite your history. And you could go in there and and mum goes, oh, darling, you are so wonderful. You know, every (sighs) decision you make is, is... no, I see, I, I don't like it at all. <laughs> Although, I'm gonna, as, a, as a slight a tangent to that, I actually wrote a short story about a device that would allow you to relive a memory. Oh, but perfectly yes. relive a memory, and then I made a movie yes, about it, and I, I was know, so disappointed. I know. But I, I did write the short yeah. story. Oh well, you took took yeah. it a step further than yeah. Me. So I did write yeah. it down, and then a, a very similar story came oh, out yeah. recently. Oh, uh, they say movie. there's no new. No. Story ideas. No, so, you're right. Yeah. yeah. So let's get back to the hereafter app, yes. which I f- find is creepy. Yeah. Okay. So now the other thing I want to point out as well is that this is not a free service. There's a 14 day free trial, mm-hmm. and then you've got to pay a subscription. Mm-hmm. So effectively, your dad disappears <laughs> if you don't keep paying for it. Yeah. That's a bit dodgy. Yeah. But it, so it's using an AI, and they're talking about digital immortality. So yeah. Tor decides I'm going to gift. My children for Christmas, an AI me. of me. Digital I know. me, chatbot me. <laughs> Dodgy <laughs> Christmas gift ever. Can you re gift that? <laughs> I'm going to re gift you my, my mother. mother. <laughs> <laughs> that might work really well because sometimes other people's parents are the ones that you should have had. Oh, yeah. I yeah. went through. Oh, I shouldn't. No, I'm not going to admit <laughs> that. <Yeah. laughs> um, in light of the password, the long password rabbit hole. Yeah. That we went down. Right. You shouldn't use this because... Because oh, it knows everything about it, you and it, it can guess your password. <laughs> <laughs> because you're going to be kindly for your children recording all of those deep and very personal, significant ideas and memories and in there is your password. So you're, you don't trust your kids. 
Well, no, it's more like where's that data stored? Tr- yes. Yeah. Mm, and okay. and I was reading recently that even um, companies, not necessarily this one, I don't know how they've created their app, but but many companies are creating apps where they will buy components in. They're yes. not yep. building from scratch. And even I know with some websites, um, well, you, know, a, you 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 use some pre made yeah. you plug in other yeah. you have plugins you that plugins. third party yeah. plugins that's right because there were some concerns about a lot of apps on the phone because there was a russian company that was making a core component that was being utilized in a lot of apps yes so that that's a perfect example yeah so i get okay i get it so you're not entirely sure that you can trust the data yeah all that aside if you could trust the data 100% would you have a digital representation of say your mother if you had some recordings and you had a whole lot of information, yeah, I'd like it. you'd have a conversation? I see it no different as a photo album. It's just the 21st century version of a photo album. Yeah, but I just I, it's a passive thing. I look at a photo and I reminisce about my mum, but you're saying you're going to jump onto a computer screen, put on a virtual reality headset and have a full-on conversation. That's not real. Yeah, I know, but it's so interesting, isn't it? It's still not real and it's creepy. Yeah, it's <laughs> not necessarily creepy. I mean, it's... It's like it's entertainment in a way, but it has no way. soul. Okay, no, this well, is, I don't this is an atheist. Soul, well, I don't so. either. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, but what I'm saying is that the the representation isn't the essence of the person. There's something about no, the essence of the somebody. Person, no, but it's um, an evocation of the person. But it's like a biography is not the person. Is no, it? yeah, I get that. But yeah. ca- could you fall into the trap? Now, I, I've often heard this, and this is also something I've never really come fully to terms with, when you've got somebody who says that their parent is their best friend. Now, it's nice to be friends with your kids, yeah. but I think that that's a bit of a line you cross if, they're the, if they are your best friend. So yeah. what happens when that parent dies mm-hmm. and then you create an A I virtual reality version of that person and you just spend hours and hours every day talking yeah, well, to them. Yeah, well, that was my short story. It's like addictive. Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah. So you're saying, I'm right. Well, you're right, but it's still interesting. <gasps> oh, talking about me being right. Yes. Yeah, um, you owe me a ticket to the movies. Yeah, Because okay. we talked about exoskeletons yeah. in our last last yeah. episode. Yeah. And um, I thought you it thought, thought it was from Alien. Alien and I thought it was from Aliens and, and it was Aliens. Yeah. So yeah. we'll have to... Yep. Choose something that our listeners might find interesting Techie, and then review it. Yeah, okay, yeah. we can do that. Right. Now, while we're talking about VR and potentially meeting our past relatives yeah. in the virtual world, um, one of the things that I love about my embracing, I guess, I've got a, a Quest 2 headset yeah. and so I play, and I, and I always talked ad infinitum about this, yeah. playing golf with my mates yeah. and uh, virtual reality gaming. The thing is, the haptic feedback you get is mm-hmm. great at fooling your brain. So what I mean by that is, I've got basic controllers, but they vibrate. And when yeah. they vibrate, in the virtual world, that could be hitting a ball, it could be playing tennis or table tennis, or it could be touching the surface of a rock, do and you, you do feel it. It feels like it's real. We're Like, we're really gullible, aren't we? It's like seeing Jesus in a piece of toast. <laughs> no, it's, it? no <laughs> it's not like seeing Jesus in a piece of toast. It's haptic feedback that our brain interprets. Yeah, well, what Jesus it? in a piece of toast is visual feedback, isn't it? <laughs> and the brain sees, like, two eyes and a bit of a Jesus beard and the hair, and it goes, oh, Jesus. Because well, isn't that funny? Because when I lay in bed, yeah. right, in my room, yeah. I live in a, in a fr- I've got a wooden frame, yeah. like, it's an exposed wooden beam in my bedroom and all the knots in the wood oh no make faces right so when i lay in bed i look up and there's a oh. dog in one corner yeah right the, okay. I, no religious icons though okay none of them look religious. Yeah. there's aliens all there right. are aliens and dogs okay. and that's what i see yeah <laughs> okay no toast and yeah. no, no pictures and toast so this is this article um, on haptic feedback yeah, on haptic feedback is sort of amping up the the haptic feedback yeah with so the finger cot a finger, <laughs> finger cut. Which I had to look up everyone because it's like you get a glove and you cut the fingers off and keep the fingers, not the glove, and then yep. you put put them on. And the sensors are in yeah. there, and it's yep. it's making it almost as good as filling with 
your skin. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. 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 And what's really exciting about this as well is there may even be applications for somebody who's vision impaired to feel braille oh, yeah, using yeah, this yeah. haptic response. Yeah. I guess what it's doing is it's, uh, it's, it's making the virtual world, and I know we'll get onto this a little bit later with the whole metaverse thing, but the more haptic it is, and I, I, there's a series that I just started watching and I'm trying to think of the name of it and I, um, I can't think of it. Anyway, they had a haptic feedback suit where they had a whole suit. And if you can think about it, you know, at the end of the day, we're talking just tiny electrical impulses mm-hmm. that can mimic muscle movement. And um, if you had a haptic glove that just gave little tiny, tiny amounts of yeah. electrical impulse, then that would feel like you were touching yeah. things. Yeah. I, I'm in for that. Okay, I, I, that's in fine. A, in a big way. Yeah. And I want a whole suit. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well... Not just wearing a suit, Patrick, but in VR you might also be kind of smelling things. Yeah, this is interesting. Yeah. So it's a wearable device that you will actually release little tiny chemicals into your olfactory senses, mm-hmm. your nose. They're actually odourless. But they're odourless, that's right. Yeah. But they stimulate touch, don't they? Or No, no. Heat, heat, and, heat and cold. Yes. Right. In the sense that, you know, when you smell eucalyptus, it's that cold sense. Oh, it's a mint, that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah Whereas mint. chili is hot. Yeah. So you're not actually smelling the aroma aspect. You, you're getting a hot and cold sensation wow. from the smell. There so you that's go. what they're working with at the moment. Okay. So, so we, we can be fooled, can't we? Yeah. And I guess once you've got the VR experience happening... Jesus and the toast. You really hung up on the toast, don't you? (laughs) I think you're hungry. That's what it is. Would you eat a toast with Jesus on it? Well, I think we know. I think you can get a toaster that actually has... Yeah, you can make make an imprint of Mary and Jesus and all that sort of stuff. I'll have to look it up. Maybe that could be your Christmas present. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I've got a whole idea now. Um, Police in the metaverse. We we talk about the metaverse, and and obviously this is a way to interact, but Interpol is taking this very seriously, um, along with... uh, It wasn't just Interpol, it was one of the other... A Europol. Yeah. So the, the big kind of international policing... Yeah, and they've recreated the French headquarters... In, in VR. VR. Oh, isn't that really cool? It is cool. Yeah. So that's interesting because there's a real concern as more of us delve into the metaverse and into the virtual world mm. that um, legally you know, law enforcement needs to be up to date with yeah. that. And we've seen that, you know, even legislation, you know, is really problematic because legislation that was written nearly 100 years yes. ago has no concept or bearing on what's happening in modern tech exactly. now. So yeah. it makes sense that if you're going to be tracking criminals yeah. because the majority you know particularly during covid i think we've seen more and more people more and more crime syndicates using the online methods of fooling people yeah. and tricking people and, and scamming them so there's, money. there's the doing digital crime but in the metaverse potentially there's the conspiring that would happen or grooming. Getting together oh, with, with your mates oh, with but, your criminal oh, mates oh yes 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 oh okay bikey gangs in the metaverse. I'm just, I just have this vision of bikies in New Horizons. It, it's a kind of a fun little app oh, right, that I've played a few right. times. And it's, yeah. it's really quite fun. You can play Frisbee and you can, mm. you've can you got this really good um, game where you run around. And it's, it's like, you know when you stage a play and mm-hmm. it's a medieval play and you mm-hmm. have fake sets? Well, the whole game mm-hmm. looks like that. Oh, okay. So you're firing bows and arrows and ah. things, but it's really fun. Yeah. And you talk to people and you can engage with them. In fact, I believe that Meta are now banning kids from using it under the age of 12, okay. so 12 and under. Um, it's been really hard because a lot of children are getting access and wanting to get access, so they're trying to clamp down on, on age-wise um, f- that happening. So, But policing is really an important thing as yeah. we delve into yeah. the metaverse. And well, I think we've got to good, be up to date. good on them. You know, we do need police in the real world, but we also need them in the digital well, world. It, it, oversight. Yeah, yeah, and, and the reality of it is, we've spoken about the fact that a journalist entering one of the virtual worlds, a female journalist, yeah. was assaulted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you know the reality of that is that there are still ongoing psychological effects from an assault, yeah. even if it's not a physical assault. Yeah. you can be intimidated yeah. to the and point also we just where you suffer trauma. About how real with the haptic suit and yeah. the smells and yeah, the exactly. skin? I mean. Yes, it's digital, but yes, it's also bleeding into 
the real world, isn't uh, it? In a big way, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. So Mark Zuckerberg is yeah. big on all of this. Yeah, he's, he's kind of staked a lot on it. He's gone in whole hog. And The Guardian had a story recently about how the shareholders are not delighted at the moment. And he, Mark Zuckerberg, is in the position that he's got these gold-plated shares that give him, you know, voting control, even though he doesn't own the majority of the of the company. And really, he, he kind of can't be fired and he also can't be stopped from doing what he wants to do. And the share price has been declining. Well, it, it dropped by 73% yeah. this year. That's not just declining. That's, yeah, that's like people that's jumping out of top stories crash. of Wall Street. Yeah, and I, I was thinking about this idea of tech winters. And oh, yeah. yeah. Your son was talking yeah, about this during a presentation about, on AI. Yeah, he was talking about AI winters where, you know, everything starts with huge enthusiasm. You think it's going to be world changing and it's just like going to happen tomorrow. And then everybody feels really disappointed and it, it's harder than we thought it was. And I just wonder whether this is an indication of a, a tech winter for the uh, metaverse that yeah. may come. Although, you know, in a way I think Mark is probably right because Facebook is going to go the way of the dinosaur if it doesn't have something really innovative and fresh. So it, it needs it. And yeah. look, they've released the new um, heads, the Oculus yeah. Pro. That's way out of the price range of most people. It's about mm. two and a half thousand Australian dollars, mm. fifteen hundred US. Now it's expensive, and they're kind of targeting, I guess, the Hololens people. So what I mean by that is Microsoft has its Hololens. It's for industry as mm. opposed to consumer. Mm. So I think that's what they're aiming for with this new Pro headset. But next year. When the Quest 3 comes out, mm -hmm. I think there's going to be a very big uptake. And, I, and look, more and more headsets are being developed all the time and mm -hmm. more people are wanting to get online. If you go with a particular headset like the Quest, does that mean it only works in the Facebook no. world? You, that's a good, very good question. What you can do is you can pair up your headset with your computer and use Steam. So if you're a PC gamer, mm -hmm. you can actually use it as Steam. So you can just make it a playback unit um, or you can use it as a standalone. And that's what makes it really exciting is because you don't need a computer to work off okay. it, but you can use it as a slave to a oh, PC okay. as well. So you're slave. not locked in. Some you're of the language <laughs> of computing is It is really weird, isn't it? Weird, yeah. yeah. Um, so yes, yeah. you can. Um, yeah. And you're not locked into that particular platform totally. Yeah. yeah. Look, we're almost at the end, Patrick, but I, I, I wanted to mention another bit of tech that looks like it might be in a bit of a tech winter. Oh, yeah. And that was um, a story CNN were talking about the autonomous vehicles or self-driving cars. You know, everybody said it was happening around the corner. General Motors in 2017 said 2019 we're going to have them. Lyft in 2016 said self-driving by 2021. Yeah, half the rides will be uh -huh. self-driving. So uh -huh. that's interesting. That And Ford also was talking it up and they were saying in 2021 as well mm -hmm. for full self-driving cars. And again, like the previous story that we looked at, CNN is talking about declining investment. So it's not just that you know, we've all been waiting for the self-driving car. Maybe we have, I don't know. But investors are tiring and, you know, they're, they're also making a slight change in direction. They're talking about focusing on trucks that have no human passengers um, because the problem with the self-driving cars is uh, there's, you know, they talk about it in terms of edge cases, those circumstances, like most of the time the self-driving car performs really well, but there are some unusual circumstances where it doesn't. But because there are so many cars and so many, pe so many people using cars, there are actually lots of... In terms of numbers, there are a lot of unusual things that happen on the so road. So what you're saying is if we say it's a one in a million chance yeah. of this happening, but the yeah. reality of it is we've got 100 million cars, yes. but it's 100 things are going to yeah. happen every single yeah, day. Yeah, 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 okay, exactly. Got it. Yeah, so yeah. That, that really is the, the 
the essence of the problem. But I asked you earlier, would you drive or would you get into a self-driving vehicle? Because I now have a car that will that has lane assist. Mm. So if I drift from left or right, the car warns me and will physically move me back into the centre of the lane. Mm-hmm. It has braking assist, so it maintains the distance. So if I'm in cruise control, it will maintain the distance and it's That's quite nice. safe. So yeah. I feel safer in my car, but yeah. I'm not that safe. I don't feel that safe that I would ever let go of the steering wheel. But I'm reassured mm. uh, as somebody who gets quite tired at night. You know, mm. if I've had a long day, I'm an early morning person and I've, I'm always nervous if I've got to come back from Melbourne after a concert or something. Mm. I tend to stay in Melbourne because I'm nervous about driving mm. and not kind of steering off the road. But yeah. with this safe driving tech, I wouldn't rely on it, but I'm happy to have it there mm. because it's there to, to make my drive safer. So maybe the tech we're talking about, even though we're not talking totally autonomous, at least it's being employed in cars right now. So some of those yeah, pieces of tech yeah. are being employed. Well, there's employed. dividends, aren't there, from all the research and development? Yeah, that's absolutely. Been but you want these trucks on the road. Do you like the idea? Oh, look, I don't know. I'm not. You know, I'm not feeling passionate either way. Come on. Now you said that they look so cute. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you just liked it because it looked cute. Um, there's a company called Aurora, and they've got a. It looks a little bit like the Google car that drives along the street taking photos. It looks like a car because, from toys. Yeah, because yeah. it's got a sort of knobbly camera thing oh, on top. yes. And then it's like a little snub-nosed van. It's got no side windows because there's no people inside who yeah. need to... It's very, it is cute looking. It, it just is. needs a smiley face. It's got kind of eyes. Yeah. And, and it, it, it's yeah. operating in California, Texas and Arizona. So there, there are some autonomous vehicles functioning at the moment. It's just not been the revolution we thought. No. You've been listening to OK Smart Ass, the podcast brought to you by a nerd and a smart ass. I'm Patrick Bonello, and you can contact us by visiting our website at OKSmartAss.com or email nerds at OKSmartAss.com. I'm Tor Roxburgh. If you like getting suggestions for books, podcasts and viewing, you can find my newsletter via my Facebook and Instagram profiles. We'll see you again in the next episode. If you'd like to help the show, please tell a friend, share a post online or take the next step and support us via Patreon. Just go to patreon.com forward slash OKSmartArts to sign up. And thank you to our Patreon supporters and our listeners who get in touch. If you like what we do, make sure to hit the subscribe button and share with your friends.